welcome to Revolutionary Lumpen Radio, the podcast for the Lumpen Proletariat, to the left and to the left on the Lumpen Proletariat. For the first time, we're joined by our new co-host, a misanthropic philosopher. We're going to go into theory on proletarian dictatorship versus bourgeois democracy. I hope you really enjoy it, find it enlightening. I'm joined with a new co-host on Revolutionary Lump and Radio, the misanthropic philosopher, who you may know has worked with us on the Grand Chi episode on Cultural Degenery. I'm pleased to say that we're going to be working on a lot more episodes together. I just want to mention that there's a storm at the moment in the UK, so if you hear wind blowing in the background, I'm sorry. Uh, my paper mache new build house is not going to stop the sound <laughs> of the wind in the background. So we're going to start off working on theory from here on out. I think at least once a month I would love to commit more frequently but with me working on night shifts I don't want to commit to like any more than that and then let people down just want Uh to say with the theory of the podcast I still want to be working on and speaking to and for the lump and proletarian but as well as people from all around the world in that class and solidarity with them so that we can better contribute to a better understanding of that class which is such an enormous source of revolutionary potential. I also know that my listeners were expecting a What is the Lumpen Proletariat episode about now, but I've just been working on speaking on a more urgent matter with comrades who suffered injustice recently. I was expecting to speak to that guest yesterday, uh, but it turned out not to be a great day for them, so I'm going to hear from them on Tuesday instead. But fortunately, pleased to announce that we have on the show my comrade and co-host, the misanthropic philosopher, who is going to start working on this text for this episode, which is the proletarian dictatorship versus bourgeois democracy. So with that introduction, Ryan, do you think they could dive in the text for us? You know, from there, we can maybe take turns of reading out each section <coughs> together and then asking each other what we thought of the previous parts. And then maybe we can finish up on some more questions that we might want to ask each other or points that we want to raise. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So this is the proletarian dictatorship versus bourgeois democracy text. So the reason that we're doing this is actually just because it's important to get a paradigm understanding of the difference between the two and the fact that we actually don't live in, you know, uh, well, okay, we, we do live in a democracy of sorts, but it's not the democracy that people think that we live in. So there's a veneer of democracy, but it's actually a bourgeois dictatorship, right? So we, we're doing this text because it's going to uh, separate the distinction for people, just so you can understand um, how you should think about these things, right? Yeah. So I'm just going to start here from the publisher's note. So proletarian dictatorship versus bourgeois dis- democracy uh, originally appeared in the May 1973 issue of Revolution at that time the organ of revolutionary union the article was adopted by the revolutionary communist party usa at the time of its founding in 1975 and has currently um and has since been revised for publication so what do communists mean when we talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat how can we say that socialist society represents the interests of the great majority of people and at the same time say that it is in fact a dictatorship this article is written to answer these questions and to deal with the distortions of the bourgeois di- ruling class about communist dictatorship. The rulers of this country never stopped preaching that their form of government is the most democratic on earth and that the communist countries are cruel dictatorships where the people have no rights. Like other things these parasites put out, this stands this stands things upside down and twists reality inside out. The fact is that there are very The fact is that the very people who run this country are a small handful of bankers, businessmen, multimillionaires, and billionaires like the Rockefellers, the DuPonts, and the Mellons. Uh, In this system, which they call the most democratic on earth, they own the vast productive forces. That's what makes them capitalists, right? They own the factories, the mines, the mills, the transportation systems, all the machinery. We call that the means of production, right? And with this, they use it to exploit the working class, which are the majority of the population, for their own private profit. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It speaks the truth. Uh, I was very happy to start off on this text because I really trusted your judgment that it was a good place to start. Yeah. Uh, It speaks the truth, like I say, and as well as the fact that the text itself isn't actually that big. It's something that we could work on in short notice because we only decided to start this reading series like yesterday. Mm-hmm. 
But in that it's a short text, it's also extremely potent. Mm-hmm. I also had to recheck the author when I read it and seen it because, like, at first I couldn't believe that it came for the United States in 1975. It's yeah. extremely compatible with dialectical materialism or even a totally accurate usage of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that the more I learn about the communists in the 1970s in the United States, like, the more blown away I am at the revolutionary potential in the, in the US at that time. That is absolutely a far cry of the distorted and misunderstood lack in class consciousness of largely support of people in the reactionary revisionist democratic socialist that is the US masses of today. Like, I was genuinely amazed um, that I come mm-hmm. from there. But uh, again, the same parallels, you know, many, many people on, on podcast out there who are speaking Marxist and do have a full grasp on the situation that gives me hope in the people of the US today, besides that denouncement of, of uh, much of what you consider the revolutionary left today. <laughs> I also think that it's an important text because although the term dictatorship is largely seen as a negative one, it's important to explain why we are quite happy to use this term as communists uh, Mm -hmm. and more than that why we think it's important to apply in the form of a a proletarian dictatorship as a word i just want to bring out the fact that you know people generally think of when using the term dictator that you know people people in 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 capitalist society generally think of some middle eastern tyrant or even one from latin america because they only ever hear the term tyrant or dictator used from bourgeois news outlets that of course govern capitalist societies backed by the state's mass media when in actual reality this is just you know propaganda used to take away from the fact that the only real dictators are the ruling class bourgeoisie or whoever they install as public dictators to serve their capitalist imperialist interests after overthrowing true democratically elected government officials for you know from using military coups or again propaganda tactics and class war so this text is important to show that there will be a dictatorship but it's going to be by the people for the people and not by the bourgeoisie as it is currently also i think the only changes in the text from what was written back then in 1973 uh, are the technologies of the private forces that it describes mainly as well as you know the growth in the military industrial complex which has absolutely has to be brought up uh, which now extends to even police forces in the US who look like military personnel as they enforce private ownership and the displacement of indigenous people from land even to this day in the, in the US but you know tying us into us at home quite honestly even I've seen a rise in the armed police in the UK on the streets recently. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes at least twice. You know, pigs wielding glocks on the hips um, who have even stopped me on my way home from work, surely only to intimidate me and tell others um, of their elevation of force. Mm-hmm. Like, honestly, this really happened. I can't think of any other reason for them stopping me. I clearly had on a, a fucking KFC cap at the time because I was on my way home from work on foot, but I got pulled over by a police Xbox, you know, a BMW X5 class car with all the luxuries and amenities that you'd need while being paid to sit in luxury and oppress the reactionary behaviours of people impoverished. But, like, uh, go a bit off topic from the text here, but it's just to bring out the actual material effect of our lives of us people on the streets. So I'd like to point out the weapon industries are largely just another business to the ruling class, the stock market that depends on ruling class terrorism for profit, which is, you know, I think an absurd but accurate statement to make because these are private industries that the ruling class do invest in and support in the stock market. Mm. And those same people or politicians implement policies that require the purchase of those weapons from industries that they themselves have an investment in. So they just literally make legislation that guarantees a return of their investments in the stocks that they've already invested in. And these things that I mentioned are the effects of these, you know, vast production forces 
that was mentioned at the end of the text and we see this in the form of firearms in our streets in the UK we see a military like police force in the US and not, and not to mention the development of technologies to better murder people at the touch of a button on the other side of the world with more sophisticated weaponry so again I just wanted to mention <coughs> that this text was written before drone strikes existed but it's important to contribute like where we can to the truth on how these bourgeois dictators operate in today's terms so mm-hmm. like, is there anything you'd like to add on to that here, Comrade Ryan or can, can yeah. we move on? I mean, on that topic there, right, there's actually a number of different subjects or books that we can even do just on that topic alone, right? So do you know um, Smedley Butler's War is a Racket? Do you know that one? I've heard of it. I've never read it, unfortunately. Yeah, like the whole book is probably too long to do a single video on, right? But like, we can definitely take selections of that and go over that because that's definitely one that everyone should read, pay attention to and understand the message of, right? So he was like a, a general in the U.S. Army. He was like the highest ranked guy at the time. And yeah, he literally said that the whole point was that he waged wars for, you know, the stock market and the private profit of those organizations. And he said that he was like a gangster for Wall Street, essentially. And um, yeah, that's what the military is by and large, right? Yeah, I know what you're saying. We're like the general at the very top of the military who's come out and said all of this, but these generals, these government officials, it's what we're talking about. It's no conspiracy. It's literally just how it is. It's, it's no secret. It, obviously, nobody at, in the ruling class is even acting like it is. It's the people themselves who are like turning a blind eye to this shit and not actually willing to accept it because these are reactionary people who are taught not to re- accept it as, as a reality by these ruling people. And the fact that like he can come out with a book and all that and a fair mm-hmm. profit from a book which points out all of this murder as if like he's literally being a component in all of this murder and the destruction mm-hmm. for stock people and people are willing to buy a book for it and, 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 and to read it and contribute to his life even further than what he's being paid to do that and you, you know it's just it's just really a joke and mockery so <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying uh, learn it read it you're already listening to it so well done you know congratulations to you but this does is help us understand the mechanisms of of why he can do what he can do and, and make a book about it and I'm sure it's a very fucking interesting book <laughs> mm-hmm. but again I don't ever pay to read that download then online <laughs> that is... yeah it's it's free online like yeah. anyone can get it in PDF form and I mean even though it's I'd rather him like write that book than not you know what I mean like even though he's yeah. done everything that he's done like it's better uh, it's better for him to like turn on that and write the book and say like this is what it was because he even yeah, writes about like I mean, how he went into it thinking that everything was, you know, like he was the good guy and everything and that everything's good and that this is actually how it should be. And then he writes about like, oh, actually it's not. Like, I messed up this one. Mm, I, yeah, I can't even imagine the tremendous bit. And, uh, but, you know, this is a reason why it's systematic and when we talk about the ruling class and like he is a part of that ruling class, Mm -hmm. part of this state but again it's it's systematic it's no one thing it's no one individual it's a systematic ideology that you know forces people to do that and if it weren't him in that position it would be somebody else Mm -hmm. this this is you know again reasons why we talk about these and do this thing that is calling class consciousness so that this ideology can this put this disease in people's mind can finally be absolved and and people like him can come forward and actually to, you know, turn the other way to this shit and then, again, spread the class consciousness in his, his own way, I guess, maybe. So, yeah, that was an interesting point. I'm glad you yeah, put that out. It's also just important to have sympathy for those people as well, right? Because people yeah. like to, like, blame them instead and be like, you were part of the problem. And it's like, yeah, they were, sure, but, like, they were also as much victims of propaganda as anyone else, right? Like, and you should be looking at these things systemally and structurally instead of, like, this one individual was yeah, the problem. Yeah, I've literally made the mistake of, of like, blaming an, an individual for being bourgeois and... You know, it's it isn't actually productive, especially when you want people to decide by you. You can't be pointing fingers at 
at individuals and and, and abusing them or you know all these things you, you, you again have to have sympathy and empathy and combat liberalism ideologically rather than like physically I guess and you need other people to support you in that role because they, they don't want to be you know going out and attacking people and basically being horrible people which you know you would turn into yourself if you didn't see it through a, like a class consciousness ideological way <laughs> you get yeah that. I just think of the difference as like are they propagandists themselves or victims of it right and when you're talking about people in the army they are victims of it right they're yeah, not the yes. actual perpetrators of it so that's where i distinguish between like who's actually at fault and who isn't mm, okay i'm gonna move on to capitalist state yeah the next part capitalist state talks about the state the police, the army, the courts, bureaucracy and similar institutions are set up and controlled by this capitalist class. These big businessmen, the bourgeoisie or monopoly capitalists consistently use the police, the army, national guard, courts and bureaucracies to break workers' strikes and generally put down the rebellions of the poor who own little or no means of production. The police, the army and National Guard are never called out against the class of bankers and corporate executives. In short, the state is a bourgeois dictatorship. This does not mean there is a dictatorship in this country of one or several men. It does mean there is a class dictatorship where a tiny handful of profit makers rule society and uses the state as their machines to oppress the working people. Most people do not think of country as a dictatorship because the relationship of different classes is usually concealed. The monopoly capitalists do not openly admit their rule. Instead, they claim this is a democracy where everybody shares the power and takes part in running the government. The ruling class goes to great lengths to cover up their dictatorship under the mask of democracy, for it's extremely difficult for a minority of exploiters to rule by force alone. Only at the time of full-blown crisis when it can stay in power in no other way does the monopoly capitalist class rule by open terroristic dictatorship or fascism. In fact, the bourgeoisie is no more willing to share power with the majority of people than it is to share the ownership of the means of production and the wealth that it comes from. For them to function as a capitalist class, they must exploit the working class. And to exploit the workers who consistently resist the exploitation and oppression, they must use the state to suppress the workers. Of course, the ruling class has been forced to grant the workers some democratic rights, such as the right to vote, free speech, free press, etc. But the freedoms, like everything else in capitalist society, have their class content. That means one thing to the ruling class and quite another to the workers. For the capitalists, freedom of the press and free speech, as examples, mean the right to fill the airways and daily newspapers with their propaganda and lies to use them freely to debate with each other. For the capitalist, elections are a way to settle differences among themselves while making it look like everybody else has equal say. For the working class, democratic rights are the fruits of previous struggles and we fight to preserve them for they make it easier to organise and mobilise for the day when the capitalists will be overthrown. Nevertheless, democratic rights for the masses are primarily a sham and mask to cover the real dictatorship of the capitalists. This becomes especially clear when the democratic rights come into conflict with even the most basic freedom of bourgeois society. The right of the capitalists to their private property and to exploit the labour of the workers. Consider, for example, how many workers have been fired or disciplined for posting a notice on a company bulletin board or circulating a leaflet or petition while the capitalist class freely makes use of their ownership and control of virtually all the mass media. In the final analysis, all their talk about democracy boils down to one thing. The ruling class divides by struggle and compromise within its own ranks and among its paid politicians. How it will maintain its system of exploitation over the people. As Vladimir Lenin, leader of the first successful revolution, said, democracy for an insignificant minority democracy for the rich that is democracy of the capitalist society awesome yeah uh, 
is there anything you'd like to say and then i've got something to say on that actually yeah yeah um so class context is like the most important thing to take from this right mm. so it's the idea that like even though we supposedly have been granted universal rights those rights actually mean different things to different classes respectively right i mean this was written in america right so we're sort of talking about america here they talk about you know freedom of speech supposedly right it's in their constitution <clears throat> so everyone thinks that freedom of speech just means that you get the freedom to say whatever you want but again it, like it says this actually has class context so for you know individual proletarians you might think that you actually have you know freedom of speech and you can say whatever you want but then you have to understand that that doesn't just exist in a vacuum that exists through modern day society so what does that actually manifest itself as right because if you put a bullet in up you might think that's included in your freedom of speech, right? But you'll be fired for that under certain circumstances, right? So everything actually has a class context, right? And to the bourgeois class, freedom of speech just means freedom for them to fill the airwaves with their propaganda, essentially, right? So you get the news is essentially where that manifests itself most explicitly, right? Yeah. Because they're always um, displaying the viewpoint of the bourgeois class. You know, you won't ever see anything on there about you know giving a fair shake to workers or anything right and you can actually see that in like the american elections currently just sort of negative press of even though bernie sanders isn't like the answer or anything you can definitely tell that he is outside the sort of traditional bourgeois class circle and uh, the negative press he gets as a result of that mm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, <laughs> I mean, they literally own all the ownership of the mass media. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, the sway of influence they can have on people and the ultimate freedom of speech. And if we do actually get to a level where people have a, a, a wide array of speech in the same methods, for example, you don't see any socialist television, um, no. it, like you know, in the UK or the US. And if they did, that we live in a world where their monopoly did absolutely shut it out. So, I mean, in, in most cases, they would end up paying off the people who are producing this kind of mass media. Or it's something I, I wrote down as well on this is um, it mentions putting something on a company board bulletin, uh, like, I mean, a, a wall with a note and a pin in it. Like, if you shared something and with an anti-capitalist sentiment and, you know, left it in work, well, you could very well be liable to being fired. And, if you know, you could be talking about having a certain political opinion. You could be talking about, you know, being pro-environmentalist when, when, when that company is, like, extremely damaging to the environment. So, you, again, you could be liable to being fired. And, and a lot of these cases I've seen, even within unions, unions snitching on union reps who are socialist. And um, GMB is, is somebody who actually has, has done that. And, you know, they've actually snitched and they called the company who they work for and said that this person's basically a, a bad egg. Uh, because yeah. they were, they were like, they were uh, socialist, you know, and, and uh, they were working for campaigns and you know protests and that, uh, which the actual union didn't support. Never mind the actual company, but in many cases you can see capitalists affecting the, the you know board members and, and big heads in unions. So, you know, this is absolutely true, and uh, more so, it's all mm -hmm. extremely ve very relevant. This control of freedom of speech also extends, didn't have it at the time, but it extends to social media these days where, again, you could get fired for having activity on your social media sites, such as, you know, all these protests and whatnot that you do, or even sharing a meme about having a shit and work, you know, while you're clocked down, getting paid. Like, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't remember where I saw it, but, like, yet yeah, somebody's actually shared this meme on social media just to have the, the boss comment saying that, you know, they, they can shit all they want because, um, you know, they're fired. So this, mm -hmm. is, again, is bourgeois control over what it actually means to have free speech and this text of free of does extremely well to, to to bring this out mm -hmm. so i mean of course like us people have to be very careful what we do and say in case these ruling class you know hears us and fires us from our wage slavery whereas on the other hand or even dialectically speaking they can post any kind of shite they want in their social media in their news agencies that reach millions of people and condemn others who disagree with them you know nationally or internationally with, with with little or no accountability mm -hmm. Reactionary and liberals again in turn like literally just eat this shit up, you know, like thinking it's true and whatnot. But again, uh, just like these freedoms and rights, it's just literally to save the ruling class. Definitely. 
Yeah, you can comment on that or we could go ahead to um, the free world. I think we're good. So I will now read this next paragraph. Sweet. When the capitalist class talks about freedom, it does not mean that the people have or should have rights. It means that the capitalists are free to exploit the people to make profits. This is why, according to the US ruling class, the free world includes countries like South Africa, where the African people, the great majority, are not even allowed to vote and are forced to live in concentration camps. So what, reason the capitalist, all the better, because we, the Rockefellers, General Motors, and others, are free to set up our operations and make millions. So this was written in a time when um, South Africa was still an apartheid state. So this actually isn't true today. Like, you know, the people there are better off than they were when this was written. Um, this is written under apartheid South Africa when the country was literally, like, divided by in two. So it's better than this today, but it's still, you know, bourgeois dictatorship, right? Yeah. The free world in military dictatorships in Latin America and feudal kingdoms in the Middle East where the people live as serfs or slaves, it is anywhere the monopoly capitalists that are free to invest their capital. That is why imperialist wars like Vietnam are fought in the name of freedom, even though the US set up and supported the Taiyu regime, which maintained an open and undisguised dictatorship over the masses of people in South Vietnam. But there is one sense in which the capitalists want the workers to be free. We must be free of ownership of the means of production. We must have no other way to make our living except to go to work and enrich capitalists. This is clearly shown by the historical development of capitalism. The capitalist class in every country has continually ruined the small farmers and property owners, driving them to the cities and factories in desperate search of employment. In this country, this has gone hand in hand with the armed theft of Mexican and Indian lands. So yeah, this is obviously written in America. So everyone knows that, you know, there was a, essentially a genocide of Native Americans. It was called the Trail of Tears. It was inst implemented under um, Andrew Jackson. It's called the Trail of Tears mm -hmm. and also Mexican land. So a lot of California today used to be Mexico, even parts of Texas, I believe as well. You know, things like Los Angeles, right? That's a, yeah, you can tell that that's a, a Latin name. So yeah, they, they essentially took it. They just took that land. And as our capitalist rulers have extended their investments and their system of exploitation throughout the world, they have ruined and impoverished the masses of people in other countries, robbing them in their own homelands and forcing millions to come to this country where the capitalists can employ for cheap wages those masses yearning to be free. So that is a call, of course, to the original slave trade, which ex slavery existed obviously before the Americans participated in it, but they definitely used it. Slavery was essentially the economic engine of capitalism in America to begin with so obviously like the cotton trade in the south was the main economic driver and back in those days you know sort of like pre-1900s the south in america was the richer of the two so today when you look at america it's the exact opposite right the north is generally considered the richer because you have new york and california sort of north and the south are genuinely considered like flyover states or nonsense like that but back in those days it was the complete opposite so slavery um all the cotton mills and the cotton farms and everything were in the south and they were complete economic powerhouses because of it and even though the idea here is that you know capitalists consider free anywhere that they can um exploit the labor and invest their money which is why they consider america to be you know we have freedom here because like we said everything has class context so for them freedom is the freedom to invest my money and exploit people to make myself richer um, which is how you know slavery came around yeah good point i just want to respond to that comment actually again at first it talks about you know all the better because we have the Rockefellers, General Motors, and the free to set up operations and make millions. You can add mm -hmm. on a list of, of new companies, including you know Tesla Industries and whatnot to that list, and um, bring context to that today. But you mentioned that, and this is like a, like the anti-imperialist in me is going to show here because it mentions about how people in Latin America, Latin America, the Middle East, like live as serfs or slaves, and mm -hmm. we thought about it in Africa how it was like apartheid Africa, and then it was actually slaves, and now it's to bring up the fact that like that's still like actually going on uh, you, see that, you see this in Libya and whatnot but something I wanted to bring out from this is where it talks about uh, the capitalist class in this country have continu continually ruined farmers and property owners driving them into cities and factories uh, in this country this has gone on hand in hand with the theft of Mexican and Indian lands but that was then and like this is now uh, to contextualise it and be pro 
anti-imperialist. I mean, I think globalization is literally the hand of these ruling classes physically. It's their physical manip- manipulation over this capital and other people's labor that extends beyond its own borders or mm-hmm. on, on, on its set of its borders in Mexico is Mexico or like Latin America. Now it goes, you know, further on throughout the whole East and even into India and whatnot. And you see this very much with the cases of, you know, farmers and people making coffee or whether it's soybeans in Latin America again or even, you know, in India. You see a lot of these fair trade agreements like Rainforest Alliance Certificate. People in all of these are, again, as you mentioned, people who see it as free trade, where these mm-hmm. replaces fair trade. It's it's literally just going on the exact same, except we're, instead of just Mexicans and whatnot, it's extended further beyond other borders and whatnot. So, again, that's just something I really wanted to bring out of this because people are still being forced on these lands having to make crops for Monsanto um, and then they often can't afford it and then yet they've got to go into the cities which is of course great for globalisation and capitalism because they're no longer working on farms Mm -hmm. they're being full on wage slaves being exploited even greater um, while living in a life of debt and poverty to maintain this ideology of capitalism and uh, materialism and being this individual that these capitalists want you to be which you know you weren't very much a, a materialist as you were living life comfortably as a farmer and whatnot um, so yeah that's just a, a, a show of imperialism and imperialism is globalization and globalization is what they call a free world and that was the plan back in 1975 but this is where we're at to today which is the reason that we're doing these texts is to bring out how they can be applied to today mm-hmm. um, and just to go into what I've heard, I might repeat myself here but this is relevant to today like no bullshit if you search modern slavery you'll find that like people in Libya and, and I use Libya as an example because it's a country that the US just recently decimated for this very purpose of capitalism and to keep these countries locked in medieval states of existence um, with, with serfs and peasants and, and even slaves because people are literally sold the slaves to this and I mean if you actually search that on you know, a search website you'll, you'll find this in the bourgeois papers even even ISIS was a reaction to the US strategy in the Middle East and of course like it's well known that they use slave for like a number of gruesome purposes and if you consider the dialectic of this on on the masses you know, like just consider how freaked out the people like of Europe were over like the migrants of people fleeing these places uh, in the last few years that's well it's even led up to like the recent desire for Brexit for you know Trump closing the borders and whatnot and you can see that like this flooding of immigrants for cheap labor again forcing these people out of these places to go into the cities uh, of Europe or the United States is literally like nothing new to history at all and in fact like I said the ruling class interest then and now in the form of internal social political segregation and furtherism further and racism like racism in this country to close our borders so to speak that it's great for profits and again even built up a need to go and invade these countries even further and whatnot because this is what racism does and that's why you have to to fight racism, to fight imperialism, because that just further helps to take away all these rights given to us as workers, uh, just like we're going to lose many rights in the UK because we're leaving the EU, but this is from this reactionary nightmare that they have created for us people Mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, as as well as the the exploited elsewhere in the world. So any comments on that, or shall we move on? Yeah, definitely. It just comes back to like class context again, right? So when we talk about freedom of movement, it's freedom of movement for who to do what, right? So freedom of movement for a proletarian class, right, generally means to go between country uh, freely. And you, of course, can't do that. We have borders. We have all sorts of checks and balances. And, you know, countries reject certain people for certain things. But, of course, the capitalist class enjoys freedom of capital, right? They can move money across borders with no problems right there's no there's no taxes there's no penalties there's no you know they can move money across borders with total impunity they can do whatever they want with it which is just another way of showing you 
that there is class context to everything, every right that you think you enjoy. Um, just think about that from like the capitalist point of view and what they mean by that, uh, because it's definitely different. Yeah, they don't just move it over with um, like no consequence. It's pure benefit. It's yeah. it's, it's it's great for them. <laughs> like there's nothing negative. Uh, right. About yeah. I meant no negative consequences. Yeah, you're right. They benefit greatly from it, no doubt. That's why they yeah. do it. Yeah, bastards. Um, so yeah good sure. stuff I totally totally agree with that yeah, I'm going to move on now to the next part I think we're probably halfway through now uh, constitution mm-hmm. so what about the bill of rights freedom of speech doesn't this show that the people do have freedom in this country going back to the beginning many of the founding fathers of this country if you're going to add in ideology uh, had no intention of granting even these limited rights to the common people but they had to promise certain freedoms to get the working people to fight on their side this combined with the revolution and the upsurge of people around these rights forced them to be written into most state constitutions it was only after wide opposition to the original constitution and further struggle that the Bill of Rights was added as a series of amendments. The real attitude of many of the founding fathers was expressed by one delegate at a constitutional convention in 1787 who said to his fellow delegates' approval, the people immediately should have as little to do as may be about the government. So he's basically saying, like, let's just keep it us, the government, and not the people, and, and that's mm-hmm. what he did. And the Constitutional Convention officially sanctioned slavery, declaring the slaves to be three-fifth human beings. To be counted as such a purpose of distributing votes and collecting taxes among the states, Washington, the father of this country, in quotes, and many of the other people who piously declared that all men are created equal, were themselves the slave owners, as well as the big land owners. In the struggle against the British and their supporters, the rise and ruling class of this old country did contribute to progress, to the development of capitalism. At that time, an important step forward for society. And to carry out this struggle, they had to involve the common people in politics to a limited degree, to motivate and mobilise them to fight under difficult conditions, I guess, to help bring about capitalism. Mm-hmm. But as soon as the British had, had been defeated, the new ruling class feared that if the people had too much to do with this politics, then they'd get out of hand. They would not be content to work under wretched conditions for the capitalist and slave owner masters. So the people's rights remained rarely paper rights and their rebellions were crushed with brutal armed force. This has been the case throughout the history of this country. At the time of the Civil War, for example, the industrialists and bankers of the North recognised that for both politically, political and military reasons, they had to declare the slaves emancipated in order to win the war. And for a short time after the war, during this period of reconstruction in the South, the former slaves and poor whites fought for and won some rights. But as their struggle for democratic rights included the right to own land and property, conflicted more and more with the capitalist drive for profits, A reign of terror was unleashed against black people and their allies among poor white farmers and labourers. Since that time, capitalism in the US has developed into monopoly capitalism. Small-scale operations have been taken over and combined with giant corporations like Standard Oil, General Motors, GE, US Steel, etc., Tesla Motors. With this, the basic contradiction of the capitalist system between the highly socialised character of productive labour and the concentration of ownership of the means of production and the appropriation of wealth in fewer and fewer hands between working class hands and the capitalist class has grown more and more intense. The capitalist class in the US can no longer contribute to the development of society by overthrowing more reactionary forces like the British colonial rulers or the southern slave owners. Today, the monopoly capitalist itself is the greatest obstacle to progress which must be overthrown. Since it is completely reactionary, the monopoly capitalist ruling class resorts more and more to open violence to suppress the people of the US, as well as people throughout the world. As the judges, police, troops, officials, all are used to attack the people's struggles, it becomes clearer and clearer that capitalist society means democracy and freedom for the capitalist minority, and oppression and exploitation for the great majority of people. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, have you got any comments on that? Um, yeah, so 
I mean, generally speaking, capitalism's gone through many phases, right? So you had sort of industrial capitalism, which was the start of the industrial revolution. Before that, it manifested itself in, well, you had slavery. Before that, you also had feudalism, right? Yeah. So this is this is a difference in the means of production and the people's relation to it. So during that time, the United States, because when, when this, this paragraph starts off talking about, you know, the Bill of Rights and the freedom of speech and everything and the Constitutional Convention, this was after America broke away they had their own revolution quote unquote from england generally right because they were living under control of the king so they were living under a complete monarchy so they decided to break away and had a revolution of sorts but now instead of being ruled by a monarch what you see happen is as the productive forces develop you have a bourgeois class develop which is of course the landowners the gentry and those become the new monarchs in a sense and they give an example here of saying about you know how the people should have as little to do with government as possible but also you can see it in the way who they granted rights to vote so you had to be white you had to be a landowner so this only gave the right to vote to landlords essentially to begin with so you can just see how all of these systems are set up to protect people with money land wealth generally and as time goes on, people without those things have generally won more rights and sort of chipped away at those things. But it's never going to be enough. And you can see that this is actually historical materialism here. We're actually going through history and seeing how the engine of history is actually an engine of class struggle, right? You can see that the Bill of Rights and the freedom of speech, when it was developed, was developed with the class interests in mind of the people developing it. It's just interesting to see, like, history is... That's exactly how history works. Yeah. To talk about that interest now, I'll comment. So, again, it talks about guaranteeing freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. like, even the fact that it is, like, this freedom of speech is, is given to us and mentioned, that, like, that it has to be put into a so-called right. It's, like, really telling that... that it has to be given to us by the ruling class as we make the laws and the legislations. Like, it just shows how absurd this bourgeois democracy is that we live under. I don't think that anybody should have to tell you or anybody else that it's okay to say what's on your mind. Like, as long as it's, like, within sensible reason, it's not harmful to others. Like, it's it's not intended to cause offence, like, abuse or, like, racism. But, like, freedom of speech isn't a term used for this way. It's used in the context that it's okay to disagree with the bourgeois democracy vocally. And it's like this because although you can disagree and be heard, it's not something you can actually change because of institutions like the state and, as we mentioned earlier, the control of the mass media directly reaches the masses uh, by the bourgeois. Like, your freedom of speech isn't actually going to get you nowhere to change the material reality that we live in to change the bourgeois dictatorship and the so-called democracy. Mm -hmm. So... Of course, that is, you know, if your speech does move the masses in a way that has physical effects to change the state of the bourgeois democracy beyond that of simply being like sound waves that dissipate with no actual effect in the physical world because of a lack of class consciousness for the most part. The section also points out that like not only are you allowed the freedom of speech as long as it has no genuine impact on the state of the dictatorship, but it also gives the illusion that in fact that we live in a democracy, which the proletarians have a say in, as you should have in an actual democracy, but this is just an illusion, as it points out, like, hence the title of the text, Bourgeois Democracy, uh, mm -hmm. in quotations. Like, it, it finishes up that not only are these so-called rights given to the people of the US in order to defeat the British, even being forced to abolish slavery of other human beings, but it tells us how clear it is that a capitalist society means democracy and freedom for the capitalist minority and oppression and exploitation for the great majority of the people. So, yeah, I really love that section. Definitely. How is that? Do you got any thoughts or um, shall we move on? Um, I can read this section here. Cool. So this section actually deals with socialist revolution and essentially answers the question like what is to be done given everything that we've now learned in the previous sections, right? Yes, so this situation can only be reversed by socialist revolution and to ultimately overthrow capitalist rule. So the first task of this revolution is to smash the power of the bourgeois state through the armed might of workers and allies. The bourgeois and its armed forces are disarmed. The political structure and the courts and bureaucracies of the bourgeois state and all its rules and regulations aimed at enslaving the people are abolished. 
Once in power, the working class moves to socialize the ownership of the means of production, making them the common property of society. To resolve the basic contradiction of capitalism, to break down the obstacles capitalism puts in the way of progress, and makes possible the rapid development of society. Socialism is a higher form of society than capitalism. It is bound to replace it all over the world, just as capitalism replaced the feudal systems of landlords and serfs. In the process of socialist revolution, the working class and its allies build up their own state machine, and this is manifest in the dictatorship of the proletariat. Workers are armed and organized into people's militias and armed forces. The capitalists and their enforcers are punished for crimes against the people. This dictatorship imposed by the working class on the former exploiters over new capitalist elements who arise under socialism is absolutely necessary in order to crush their resistance and prevent them from wrecking socialism and restoring capitalist rule. Although the country's capitalists like to point to the Soviet Union today, this is 1975, and say that this is what communism means, the dictatorship of the proletariat is not currently what exists in the Soviet Union today. The working class was once in power in the Soviet Union and was building a powerful socialist society, which was the bright hope of workers around the world. But the capitalist class was able to stage a comeback when a new bourgeoisie seized power in the mid-50s and turned the Soviet Union back from a socialist country to a capitalist one. Today, in the Soviet Union, as well as Cuba and most Eastern European countries under its thumb, these are now currently examples of bourgeois dictatorship. So they disguise themselves as socialist countries where the working class rules, but in reality there is a new capitalist class which rules and enforces strict dictatorship over the working class. The dramatic events in China since the death of Mao Zedong and the arrest of those mostly closely associated with him are signs of the fact that a new bourgeois has seized the reins in China and is attempting to steer this country too down the capitalist road. So that's essentially talking about Deng there, and he took power after Mao put him in prison. He essentially took control and instituted what they called Dengism, which was, he was essentially a capitalist roader, and he put China on the road to capitalism and ultimately resulted in what China is today, which actually is um, a, a capitalist class, um, a capitalist country. There are This paragraph is kind of controversial because there are definitely going to be people who even call themselves communists that are going to disagree with a number of this, um, especially like with the Soviet Union. People are going to say, you know, even up to the 1990s, it was definitely you know, a, a true dictatorship of the proletariat, which I wouldn't agree with. Uh, there are even, you know, subreddits on Reddit, like, you know, our communism and our socialism, that agree that China today is um, a socialist state, which I also... Of liberals, sorry, go on. Yeah, 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 I also disagree with that, right? Like, um, and anyone who isn't even sure about that, you can see they literally arrested Mao and then Deng took power and put the country on the road to capitalism again. So anyone who thinks that like today's China is like some sort of, you know, socialist utopia um, just needs to look at how that state that as it currently is came into being. At the same time, there is a dictatorship over the former capitalist exploiters. There is the unparalleled extension of real democracy for those oppressed by capitalism, the working people. The proletarian state is a million times more democratic than even the most democratic capitalist state. No longer do a handful of parasites run society for their own private profit, and the working class sets out to transform all of society. To accomplish this, the government is set up and run by workers. So this includes the press, television stations, schools, etc., which the capitalists use to mold public opinion and shore up their rule. These are stripped from them and they become the common property of the working class and the masses of people. Yeah, so this actually talks about like cultural hegemony here, right? How those in power, which is of course the bourgeois dictatorship, uses the um, levers of society, the press, TV stations, schools, etc., to mold public opinion. That is um, cultural hegemony. They, they have a hegemonic control over culture, which is why and how they're able to um, ensure that they stay in power. Yeah. Since the working class and the socialist society built under its leadership represent the interest of the great majority of society, the workers openly proclaim their role and openly dictate to their former exploiters and tormentors. The rule of the working class cannot be exercised by deceiving the masses of people, but only by their active involvement in every part of political life of society and raising their political consciousness. Thank awesome. you for that.
I love this paragraph. I love it so much because, like you, like you mentioned, it does essentially answer like what is to be done. The next paragraph basically explains why it should be done. And this paragraph is also, as you said, extremely controversial. It was extremely controversial to me, and I know that much. Mm-hmm. I, I'll just go into why and, and my comments. If you got nothing else to add on, no, no, go for it. I don't think you can read this section enough, and it's. That section was actually well worth listening to and, and going back to to listen to that section a few more times because it does truly describe a socialist revolution and what it must look like to get politician dictatorship and take the power and control away from the capitalist bourgeois. I think it's also very interesting how it talks about how capitalists like to point to the Soviet Union back then and say, like, this is what communism means when the Soviet Union was not only like not actually communism at the time but mm-hmm. like it, it, it's interesting that they're still doing this to this very day point like and i mean talking about liberals and that where they're pointing to a model of like unfinished communism just after two world wars like defeating nazi germany as well as being attacked by external and internal reactionary forces that ultimately want to make the soviet union like capitalists again because uh, of course they eventually succeeded in this i just want to point out uh, where is it there yeah it's it said you know today is the soviet union as well as cuba and most eastern european countries under the storm for example support our dictatorships like whew. so this is the spicy bit so mm-hmm. I, th- I think that it was also interesting that the denouncement and embarrassing of the Soviet Union state at that time uh, is used today whenever any anybody like wants a socialist revolution, uh, they claim that that's what it looked like. I can't help but think while acknowledging this, the writers fail to grasp just how they were susceptible to this capitalist tactic uh, when talking about socialist Cuba, who have got to defend uh, because of the reason that you just said that it's literally like a, a, a capital, a bourgeois dictatorship. Because Cuba, of course, remains today as the world's last remaining beacon of hope to exist for socialism. So to use that term that it's a bourgeois dictatorship is fallen prey to this liberal ideology that they mentioned was used against, you know, the Soviet union at the time uh, i just think that this goes to show just how being in the united states as the writers were at the time can expose even the bright intellectual dialectical marxists to be susceptible to bourgeois propaganda because i think they were completely wrong talking about cuba in that context but again this is a sentiment of of a quote example of bourgeois dictatorship that still rings true but when people think of today that it's like you know people in the u.s still view it as, as like you know the liberals in the u.s still view it as like oh that's that's what communism is do you want that and of course there's many reasons why it's like that and, and economic embargoes for over 60 years don't help as well as all the uh, the tactics used to use their free sources of free speech to to sway the masses opinion on, on, on these uh, subjects and and their uh, comments we should all support but uh, Again, it also mentioned in support of China at that time as like communists. So that that's just dead interesting to me because I like I don't think even at the I don't know me China history that well, but I don't think that it was like pure communism. But again, like you mentioned, people in the US even to this day would support it as a communist society and they would also denounce Cuba so yeah they're just dramatic pan- parallels like that you still see today and uh, the writers brought that out that's interesting actually to me yet the text finishes on how dialectical the rule of the working class is to that of the bourgeois class in that it cannot be exercised by deceiving the masses but instead it's only possible with the involvement of all the people and this is because of the ownership of the means of production by the people and our need to work together to appropriate, you know, the means of production, the actual capital that exists in society as well as our labour in order to shape the world, to live in a communal communist society that looks like how we'd want it rather than want to benefit, you know, the few owners of all the world's capital, uh, the bourgeois democracy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah so i'm gonna finish up on this if you've got nothing else to add i'm sorry that i'm gonna be talking again but uh, uh, we haven't got long to go now and this is actually the most interesting packet passage in all of this because it talks about why we should do this so is there anything you want to add on before we we finish on this last paragraph um i don't believe so okay good stuff let's go from socialism to communism But socialism is not a utopia. It replaces capitalism 
but cannot do away in one stroke with the inequalities, the old selfish ideas of the remnants of capitalism. Socialism itself is only the lower stage and transition to a higher form of society, communism, where there will no longer be any classes and therefore there will no longer be any need for the dictatorship of the proletariat. During this entire transition period, the working class must remain and strengthen its rule over the foreman exploiters of the bourgeois elements that arise under socialism, prevent them from subverting the new society and restoring the old, and overcome the remaining influence of their dog-eat-dog, look-out-for-number-one philosophy or the individual. When everybody in society can share equally in mental and manual work, in producing goods and services and managing the affairs of society, when the outlook at the root of the working class, putting the common good above narrow individual interests, has become second nature to members of society. When the goods and services can be produced so abundantly that money is no longer required, needed to exchange them, they can be distributed to people solely according to their needs. The society would have reached the stage of communism. Classes will have been completely eliminated and the state, as such, will be replaced by the common administration of society by all of its members. As this happens throughout the world, mankind will have scaled great mountains and will look on for a whole new horizon. The experience of the socialist countries, the Soviet Union under the leadership of Lenin and Stalin and the People's Republic of China during the lifetimes of Mao Zedong, <coughs> And, and Fidel has shown that the working classes can overthrow the exploiters and run society in the interests of the masses of people and the Cuban people, might I just say. The fact that the rule of the working classes was overthrown in the Soviet Union and now temporarily in China and Cuba also shows how stubborn the class struggle is under socialism and the need for the proletarian dictatorship to be maintained. Communism will show that people can do away completely and forever with the institutions and influences of capital and the other forms of class society. Karl Marx, founder of communist philosophy and the revolutionary workers' movement, wrote, The existence of classes is only bound up with particular phases in the development of production. The class struggle necessarily leads for the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the dictatorship itself only constitutes itself to the transition to abolish classes and to a classless society. Oh, that's just so sick. Uh, <laughs> boss, <laughs> have, you, have you got anything to, to add on there? Because I've actually uh, got, got a decent little response to that. Um, yeah, ultimately, you know, the, the whole point of this is the abolition of class society. So the difference here between, like, a bourgeois dictatorship is that they will maintain the dictatorship to keep everyone else oppressed permanently, right? But the point here of a dictatorship of the proletariat is actually to get rid of class society generally and actually abolish the classes not to perpetually oppress with a, a group of people in charge not to just replace one exploiter with another you know yeah the, it's literally called the transition from socialism <laughs> to communism so yeah. yeah it could be said that socialism demands a proletarian dictatorship but inherently communism is without uh, a class structure society and that is what a proletarian dictatorship would look like but of course it's how that's used and why that's used that's important rather than just fundamental principle that there shouldn't mm -hmm. be classes we can remove classes when as it talks about you know what people need and and how things resources are distributed once these needs are met by the people, then we will no longer need a class structure society, the vanguard party, uh, to, mm -hmm. to distribute this as, as well as face off the reactionary nature of people who want to overthrow for some absolutely bizarre fucking reason uh, this this better world that is able to grant us you know, everything we need so that we can look to new horizons, which is think it's just you know what like life is about or should be about and i talk about life not under the capitalist society but what it means to be alive and sentient in the universe do you reckon yeah definitely i'm just gonna finish up on what i thought of that again i'd like to say wow to that piece i, I love that last bit it's sick um, everybody should go back and listen to that or just you know what just just roof just restart this whole episode once you've finished i'm sure it, i'm sure um, it does nothing but 
like it is, is at the very least interesting as well as enlightening especially if you're new to a uh, marxist thought or socialism or communism this is this is a boss text to start off on it pretty much gets to the gist of what it is so i think that the really most inspiring part of the text and its idea is that it tells us why we should be inspired to be socialists and, and be communists and be Marxists. Communism really is, as as it says, a higher form of society. And it's one of the points out there'll no longer be any need for after the dictatorship of the proletariat. So it talks about the need for the working class, you know, how they must maintain and strengthen its rule over the former exploiters and the new bourgeois elements that arise under socialism how to prevent them from subverting this new society and restoring the old. We call this reactionary behaviours and we've seen through a couple of hundred years just how they plan on doing that through use of propaganda, torture, invasion, military coups, as well as by other means uh, to fight off this class liberation, to fight off socialism, to fight off anything but, you know, a bourgeois democracy or a bourgeois rule. And how they do that, it just shows that they've really got no fucking shame or sense of humanity in their desperation to maintain capitalist bourgeois rule, to maintain their lives of luxury for the few and not the many. But I think more importantly that the point of communism is not to take away many of the luxuries or possibilities to improve our life experience. But when individuals have become as it says, second nature. To members of society, goods and services can be produced so abundantly that money is no longer needed to exchange them and that they can be distributed to people solely according on their needs, as it says. But like when this happens, we can all live for the most part like the bourgeois do now uh, because there's more than enough resources on the world while being sustainable for those lives that we might want to live. If we just put our heads together and figure out how to do it without destroying the, the whole environment. But even more importantly, like as this happens throughout the world, mankind will scale the great mountain and will look onto a new horizon. So like that is to say that mankind will literally be evolved and we might not even want those lives for the most part that the bourgeois have. Instead, our values and our goals in life would have been evolved beyond the accumulation of capital, materialism, but instead we can let our imaginations run wild here because our potential is going to be virtually unlimited and we can follow our dreams and what we want during our life, you know, and this could be, be that peak physical health, like a family life that doesn't revolve around our, our, like our need for money to sustain uh, you know, such family life and relationships. Or we might choose to work on new ways to protect all the life on Earth that's been threatened by the previous actions of capitalists. Or we could even just explore the many potential experiences life has to offer us on our limited time on what is the majesty of planet Earth and the universe. We can't do that under capitalism, but the bourgeoisie can. We can't do this at all if we don't take the power away from them because like, they are destroying each, each minute of every day the potential to exist as a sentient form of life in the universe. And our life, like life, is much too precious to sit back and let them do this to us. We must defeat capitalism. And this text is one of you know many that describes why and how. So I'm glad we could study it share it and use it for inspiration to hopefully inspire others to see why we should get to a proletarian dictatorship and like it means first in the bourgeoisie scam that they call democracy it means spreading class consciousness so thank you again comrade ryan the misanthropic philosopher my mate um for choosing this text i hadn't read it before it was extremely interested i'm looking forward to all the texts that we're going to do together yeah yeah absolutely i mean i've got a, a whole number of these that we can do i'm never short of theory so i have you know everything from this website i can i can keep bringing up texts for days you know just things that i've read generally and uh we'll never be short of things to go over so that's all good um, I just hope that people have enjoyed and that you've learned something and that you'll go back and read this again and actually, uh, you know, understand the uh, the real messenger. Yeah, boss. Um, I know that you just started the Twitter as well. As well as you know, and a lot of other texts and I think people should should follow you on that. You should go on your YouTube and just see these other theories that, are, as you said, you know, you, you're not short on. 
uh, and <laughs> YouTube channel's not short and, and theory just if, if people don't have the time to read and that it's, it's good to have something that can piece together these theories um, as well as you know keep it entertained at the same time so yeah definitely so yeah with, with that said uh, we're going to finish up here that was the proletarian dictatorship versus bourgeois democracy thank you for everybody joining us here at Revolutionary Lumpen Radio I'm just going to finish off giving a shout out to our patrons, Jake, Joe, Revolutionary Left Radio. It helps support and inspire us in this show. We're going to be putting together some content for patrons soon, so if you like more content, you can find us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash lumpenpodcast. That's one word, and you can find us on lumpen.libson.com. Uh, we're on iTunes podcast also and you can find more of the misanthropic philosopher which is just one word if you search him on YouTube again you can find lots of great videos on theory philosophy that you will be entertained and enlightened from as well as that you can find us on Twitter at lumpen underscore radio as well as the misanthropic philosopher at the Zen Marxist. So if you, if you like the episode, you want to hear more from us, please subs- please like, subscribe, and share this podcast if you enjoyed it. And feel free to reach us on any of those platforms if you want to engage. Solidarity. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Peace. And everyone got excited about the technology. And I guess it was pretty incredible watching a missile fly down an air vent. Pretty unbelievable. But couldn't we feasibly use that same technology to shoot Food at hungry people. This one is dedicated to the suit wearing arms dealers, to the champagne sipping depleted uranium droppers. Keep your hand on your gun. Don't you trust anyone? Keep your hand on your gun. Don't you trust anyone? First in my scope is BAE systems Specialise in killing people from a distance Power is a drug and they feed the addiction Immediate deletion of people's existence Who says what isn't what isn't legitimate resistance To push these buttons, you don't need a brave heart State of the art darts leave more than your face guard You might impress an A&R with your fake bars Cause you probably think Rolls Royce only make cars This is for the colonizers, turn bomb providers Take this beef all the way back to Oppenheimer They call it warfare but your wars aren't fair If they were to be suicide bombers in arms fairs a scam for the funds they will mangle your son if you try to speak out they will stamp on your tongue to your land they will come till you stand up as one is begun keep your hand on your gun don't you trust anyone keep your hand on your gun don't you trust anyone Next in my scope is Lockheed Martin They will tell you when the bombs need blasting Don't think, just listen to the songs, keep dancing Do they really want us to have our own brains? Who do you think is really running Guantanamo Bay? And it might be sensitive but I'll mention it Who do you think's got us filling out the censuses? Who do you think is handing out the sentences? This ain't the BBC so there's no censorship Heard of many mercenaries getting with a clever pimp Not a gun seller but none's better than Eric Prince Make money off many things, mainly it's crime This one is dedicated to the Raytheon 9 On a scam for the funds, they will mangle your son If you try to speak out, they will stamp on your tongue To your land they will come Till you stand up as one, it's begun Keep gun. your hand on your gun Don't you trust anyone Keep your hand on your gun Don't you trust anyone Yeah. Yeah. And I have done